This episode of Middle Eight is sponsored by CuriosityStream. From their punchy debut... To their more sonically dense Contra... Through to the reflective symphonies on modern vampires of the city. Vampire Weekend have made one of the best pop trilogies of the modern day, while going from massively disputed to quite possibly the most respected band in the indie scene. And what makes their execution even more memorable is that they've done this while evolving with each ensuing album. Their progression feels so natural, and yet they've remained recognizably Vampire Weekend. If you listen to their albums in order, it makes perfect sense, like it was exactly what the group hoped it to be from the very start. Visually, they even look connected. But their musical arc is just as much about Rostenbach Manglish's evolution as a producer and Ezra Koenig's maturation as a writer. A story of a band growing up. Rostenbach Manglish, Ezra Koenig, Chris Bayo, and Chris Thompson began playing live gigs around Columbia University in the mid-2000s. When the four graduated from the New York City College, they quickly got to work self-producing their debut album bringing together a collection of musical inspirations from around the world, Vampire Weekend were a breath of fresh air. While many enjoyed their early songs, some quickly became irritated by the image cultivated by the band. Vampire Weekend were different. They tore down the aesthetic cliches of the indie rock bands before them, singing about elite status while donning cardigans and blazers. And in rock, class and wealth are fairly taboo. Other New York bands like The Strokes were quote-unquote rich kids too, but they concealed themselves behind leather jackets. Vampire Weekend didn't shy away from being themselves. Blogs proclaimed the four were overprivileged, preppy white guys ripping off West African rhythms and percussion. At first listen, it might appear that way, but the band's two main songwriters, Ezra and Rostam, are respectively Jewish and Persian. But yes, none of the members share a culture with the African or Caribbean musicians who inspired the group. It's an absurd critique considering the origins of rock itself, and Vampire Weekend's music is about as African as Animal Collective is rave. There are elements and comparisons to be made, sure, but the inspirations are a little more abstract. It was the insane hype surrounding their debut, combined with their aesthetic that turned a lot of people off and had them looking for flaws. Because you weren't going to find any in the music. Songs are meticulously crafted but remain minimal and concise. In them, Rossum and Friends effortlessly merged punky riffs with reggae rhythms and even classical moments. it shouldn't work as well as it does. It's all complemented by Ezra's hyper-literate lyrics. A thousand years in one piece of silver She took it from his lily white hat Show no fish she'd seen the thing In the young man's wing a Sloan Kettering It should come as no surprise that he's an English major. Although most of Ezra's lyrics are cryptic bits of wordplay here. His songs highlight contradictions of class and wealth, making it difficult to tell if it's all just satire. Ezra was an Ivy League college kid just talking about what he knew. The first song he wrote was Oxford Comma. A song that looks to be about punctuation, but it basically uses the theme to point out that the use of an Oxford comma is as pretentious as the rich. It's college banter, snobbish, but intelligent. Nothing that's going to change your life, but words that will definitely liven it. They seemed so sincere as a band simply trying to make catchy pop songs, and that they did. But their self-titled was so divisive because of their Ivy League pretensions and their supposed cultural appropriations. Yet, it didn't stop audiences from listening, and it definitely didn't bother Vampire Weekend considering what they had in store for Contra. Their obsession with prep culture was carried over onto their sophomore's cover art, lyrics, and song titles. College life was over, but they weren't ready to move beyond that just yet. They continued to lean into their world influences, expanding their Afro-prep style with a greater use of electronics. The intensity of their debut takes a bit of a back seat with a ballad or two that highlight Ezra's development as a vocalist. And a songwriter. We get more songs on social status, but tracks like I Think You're a Contra are evidence of Ezra's personal growth after losing in love. 
Aside from co-writing most of the group's material, Rostam is the band's keyboardist, drum programmer, second guitarist, string arranger, engineer, mixer, and producer. On Contra, he gets experimental and adds more texture and varying rhythms than before. He's great at making something complex sound so stripped down. His attention to detail is evident on tracks like Cousins. One of Vampire Weekend's more complex rhythm sections, they place multiple microphones on the snare drum alone. By layering and panning the recorded tracks, we get a much wider sound coming from the snare. The song was recorded in Mexico while on tour, and Rostam wanted the guitar parts to have a mechanical, plasticky sound, reminiscent of Spanish guitar tones. He had Ezra play the riff at half speed. and sped up the track later in editing. The final wall of sound towards the end of the track sees tubular bells in one speaker, a celeste keyboard in the other, and a distorted guitar down the middle. Even Ezra's vocals are run through a distortion compressor, adding to the raw feel. You can turn your back on the bitter wood. You can turn your back on the bitter wood. You can turn your back on the bitter wood. You can turn your back on the bit to it. It's little flourishes like these that almost go unnoticed, but they aid in delivering one of the edgiest tracks on the album. Now, it didn't matter what the internet thought about them. Vampire Weekend managed to balance the fine line between taking big risks and playing it safe. They avoided a sophomore slump, but the responsibilities of adult life started to close in on Ezra, and the group was exhausted from growing up on a stage. Between then and taking some time off, they would live more, and it showed on Vampires of the City. Vampire Weekend stepped forward into adulthood, and their music evolved in a way that felt natural and just right. Like the cover, the atmosphere was darker, moodier, and introspective. There's plenty of variety within the track listing, and each track shows how they've matured as a band and as people. The African and Baroque elements are still loosely present, but they've moved beyond it, adding warm keys and processed drum beats. Rostam plays with even more textures than before, but it's polished and subtle. Ezra's songwriting was simplified, but also more profound than past albums. They grew to be unbelievably more conscious about life outside of campus and their generation. Lyrics carried their previous playful nature, but an emotional weight as well. Ezra is aware of time and its fleeting moments. You and me, we got our own sense of time. He has personal conversations with God. Could I have made a master well, I'm never gonna understand and juggles themes of mortality with upbeat wordplay. They improved on all fronts, again, taking risks, but staying familiar enough to fans. Modern Vampires earned them a Grammy Award for Best Alternative Album, and the group toured the world due to its success. In early 2016, Rossum announced that he'd be departing Vampire Weekend to focus on his own career as a songwriter and producer. Disheartening news for fans, as him and Ezra were the two main songwriters of the group. Ezra may be the face of Vampire Weekend, but Rostam was its DNA. It's difficult to imagine Vampire Weekend without him. Thankfully, Rostam added that he would continue to collaborate with Ezra on the band's future projects. Vampire Weekend raised their ceiling with each consequent album. I don't think any one album is better than the other. All three are different, yet all fit together so well. And each one focuses on their identity, the group's lives going through college until the dawn of their 30s. How they've transitioned from their youth to adulthood, from poking fun at college elitism to discovering the world around them and finally yearning for an extension of that fleeting adolescence. Their music is what the world is to them at that very moment. Father of the Bride will no doubt sound like a Vampire Weekend album. They'll take risks and expand on the world they've built. But what does the father of a bride ultimately have to do? That's to give away his little girl, his whole world, to let go of someone, something you've fostered since its inception. Like Vampire Weekend, they'll reminisce over the previous chapter, but are prepared for a better future. The remarkable trilogy they've crafted will remain separate from whatever they do next. The only thing that we might be able to expect from future albums is their own reflections of the world in front of them. You can discover more of the world yourself with CuriosityStream.
the sponsor for this episode. Use the first link in the description and promo code MIDDLE8 to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. Founded by the same guy as the Discovery Channel, the streaming service features over 2,000 documentaries and is all about addressing our lifelong quest to learn, explore, and understand the world around us. In Next World, Michio Kaku explains how our lives will change by 2045, how new technology developing now will change the way we live, work, and play in the future. A subscription is only $2.99 a month, but thanks to CuriosityStream, my viewers can get their first 31 days free when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash middle eight and use the promo code middle eight. Thanks for watching, ladies and gents. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like rating, subscribe to learn more about the music you love, and don't forget to hit that bell so you never miss an episode. If you'd like bonus content, a look behind the scenes of Middle Eight, even your name in the credits, please consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps in giving us more time to make these videos. Finally, what's your favorite Vampire Weekend album in the trilogy, and why? Let me know in the comments below. And that's it for me. Again, thanks for watching, and keep listening.